Amen. Joshua chapter 7. So here we are. We're after uh, the great battle of Jericho. The victory of Jericho is over. And now the Israelites are continuing to press forward into the promised land. They've come across the Jordan River in, uh, you know, Joshua chapter 5. And Joshua stood before the Lord. And the Lord basically said, you know, I am the captain of the Lord's host. And I am not... He didn't answer and say, I'm with you or for you. Um, it depend on what they did. And we talked about that last week. And of course, they did what the Lord told them to do. And they won the battle of Jericho. However, um, at the end of that situation, something went wrong. And we see that um, situation play out in Joshua chapter 7. Now, there's so many lessons in Joshua chapter 7. It could probably be uh, a sermon series in itself. But what I'll try to do is I'll just explain through the chapter um, real quickly, and then we'll go and we'll apply and look at all that. I'm going to kind of shotgun a bunch of lessons at you um, from Joshua chapter 7 this evening. Let's go ahead and just make sure we understand exactly the mechanics of what's happening in the chapter. Look at Joshua chapter 7 verse 1. It says, but the, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmel, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So first of all, we start to see, um, you know, a, a, a a, a philosophy here and some one person messed up and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the whole nation for it. So that's an interesting thing that we'll talk about in detail this evening, but basically someone took of the accursed thing. We're going to talk about in detail what the accursed thing is in a few minutes. Let's go um, through. Somebody didn't listen to what God said that they were supposed to do in the exact way that God said they were supposed to do it. Joshua, not knowing this, continues into battle in Ai. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up. Let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. He basically said, you know, send three thousand men. There's not that many people there. This is going to be easy. You know, they're on, a, they're on a bit of a high. They just took a whole city by yelling at the wall, and the wall fell down, and then they, they basically destroyed the whole city. You know, they're just saying, just send a couple thousand people. We've got this. Look at verse 5. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shabaram, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So they went in, and they lost the battle. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought us to the people over, brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God that we've been content and just dwelt on the other side of Jordan. So first of all, they lose this battle and they're all very surprised. And you can about imagine. I mean, they're all very surprised. The Lord's been telling them, I will fight for you, and I'm going to you know, drive these people from out before you, and all this. But it's interesting that Joshua, Joshua, I mean, is Joshua unspiritual? Is Joshua uh, an ungodly person? I mean, Joshua is a godly man in the Bible, and he's godly, uh, and he's a good leader. I mean, he is a very spiritual person. But it's interesting that when things go wrong, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but I want to point it out in this verse right here. When things go wrong, and we're the same way, okay? You're not more spiritual than Joshua, neither am I. When things go wrong, people rarely self-reflect. That's one interesting thing. You see it, Joshua, right away. He's like, why did you bring us here, God? You know, when things go wrong in our life, that's what we tend to see. God, why are you doing this to me? People rarely look first at themselves. That's the first thing, okay? Things in your family are falling apart. Things in your marriage are falling apart. Things in your life in general are falling apart. And the first thing that we tend to go to is, God, why are you doing this to me? Instead of looking, you know, hey, do I have something to do with what's happening here? You know, is something in this house wrong? Is something in this group of people wrong? So that's just an interesting point that even Joshua fail to self-reflect right away. Look at verse number 8. O oh Lord, what shall I say? 
When Israel, when Israel turned their backs before their enemies, he says, we're running away from them. We're turning our backs to our enemies. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it. He's saying, he's saying everyone's going to hear what happened here, and they're all going to come after us. Imagine, they are in the midst of this country, and they're surrounded by their enemies, and now they're on the run. And Joshua, being a man of war, knows what that's going to, you know, it's, it's like when you retreat from a country you've been occupying or something. You know, it's, it's the enemy rushes in and they know that they have the advantage. Look at verse number 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned. God tells them what happened here. They have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have taken of the accursed thing. So there's two things they did wrong here, first of all. We talk about the accursed thing, and we're going to talk about the accursed thing, but there's two things listed here. So they took of the accursed thing and have also stolen. So they took of the accursed thing, and we'll talk about what that is, but then they, they stole from the Lord, is what the Bible says, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Look back at Joshua chapter 6 and verse number 17. The accursed thing. So the city, the reason that it's an accursed thing, it's even called that in the first place, is because of Joshua 6 and verse number 17. The Bible says, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are within her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. So the thing, the people and the things, other than a few things, are all accursed in the city. So if anybody took any of that, that's the accursed thing. Okay, look back at Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 12. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. So they took of the accursed thing and they themselves became accursed. Interesting to note there, too. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. So I'm not going to read through all these other verses, but basically he tells them, go find out who did it. Go find out who took the accursed thing, who broke the rules. And down in verse number 18, so Joshua basically in the next few verses, he starts going through the families and saying, did you do it? What did you do? What did you take? And when he gets to Achan, this man, Achan, he confesses in verse 18. And he brought out his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said to Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done, hide it not from me. An interesting uh, point there in verse number 19 is that, did you know that confessing your sins to God glorifies God? Amen. That's an interesting uh, point that Joshua just made right there. He's like, he doesn't know. He's saying this to everybody. He doesn't know who did it. He's just saying, hey, look, you know, confess what you've done. Confess your sins and give glory to God. Because when you cover your sins, you're trying to glorify yourself. But confessing your sins to God is glorifying to God. It's a humbling thing. Look at verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. When I saw the spoils, a goodly Babylon, Babylon, Babylonish garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them, and I took them. And I behold, they are hidden the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. He said, I wanted, he coveted them. He's, he's like, I wanted them and I took them. So Joshua sent messengers. They ran unto the tent. Behold, it was hidden his tent and the silver under it. So he tells you in verse 21 what the actual items that he took were. Verse 24, and Joshua and all Israel took Achan the son of Zerah and sil the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor and Joshua said, why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned, the, turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name that the place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. So another interesting point is that when, you know, wrongdoing is punished and justice is carried out, you know, the Lord's anger is taken away. Okay? But look, 
this is a pretty serious uh, consequence that this guy went through with his entire family here. So let's look at what the accursed thing is. There's basically two categories of things that Achan took. If you look back at verse 21, it says, I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold, 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them. So first of all, he took some clothing. He took some clothing. But the clothing was amongst the things that should have been destroyed, God says. So it was accursed. It was one of the things that was accursed. He didn't listen. He just kept it for himself. So these are, you know, these are things that, you know, he should have left those things behind. But he thought, you know what? I'll just take some of these nice things with me and I'll just hang on to these things. You know, you ever felt like that in your life? that maybe there's some things that you should leave behind, but you're like, you know what? I'll just hang on to these things. Even though I know I'm not supposed to have them, I'll just hang on to these things. And, but look, here's the thing. Achan paid for it. Achan paid for what he did here. The second thing he took, what's the second thing? Look back at verse number 11. Look back at verse number 11 and look at what God says here. He says, Israel has sinned. They transgressed my covenant. They have taken of the accursed thing and also stolen. Look back at Joshua chapter 6 and verse number 19. Not everything in Jericho was accursed. Not everything was to be just destroyed. So yes, he took some things that were supposed to be destroyed and he kept them for himself. Okay? But not everything was to be destroyed. Look at Joshua 6, 19. Joshua 6, 19. Look what the Bible says. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So look, it says that not everything was accursed. Some of it literally belonged to God. Some of it literally belonged to God. So Achan stole from the Lord. He stole from God. I mean, this is a big no-no. Turn to Malachi chapter 3. Turn to Malachi chapter 3. Look, you don't want to be stealing from the Lord. And that's exactly what Achan did because God claimed these things in Jericho as his own and Achan took them for himself. He stole from God. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Look at verse number, go back to verse number 8. This is a common verse. You know, we don't talk a lot about, um, you know, money and giving here. This is a common verse used to, to prove that the Bible teaches that you should tithe. You should give a 10% of, you know, your wages to the Lord. It says, but wherein have you robbed me? In tithes and offerings. And, you know, typically if people, you hear a sermon on giving at church, you know, giving 10% of your income to the church, they'll read that verse. But it's really interesting when you read the verses right after this as compared to the story of Achan. Look at what the Bible says in verse 9. So what happened to Achan? He took of the accursed thing, he robbed God, and he himself became accursed. He and his family became accursed. And look at nine, ver verse number 9. It says, Ye are cursed with a curse. It says, For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Then look at verse number 10. So we see here, we're going to see a, a, a dichotomy. We're going to see two sides of this coin here. You're cursed with a curse in verse number 9, or verse number 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open your windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So here God is saying, you know what? Why don't you just not steal from me? Why don't you just bring your tithes in and why don't you just see if I will not bless you for that? Amen. Instead of, you know, verse number nine. Look, tithing is an act of faith. Amen. I would be like, it would be very, like from a personal perspective, from a personal perspective, it would be really easy for me, like from a personal perspective, to look at the tithe that I give to this ministry every single month and look at that and just be like, oh man, I could buy some stuff with that. You know, I mean, because look, I mean, 10% of your income, if you're working hard, I mean, that may seem like a few bucks. And it may be, but look, what in the world would you be thinking if you did that? I mean, you're robbing God, God says. He's like, why don't you just have a little bit of faith? Why don't you do what you're supposed to do? Look, here's the thing. That 10% of your income, it's not yours. It's God's. Whether, whatever you do with it is up to you, but it's God's. 
And look at what happened to Achan. Look at what Malachi chapter 3 says here. Uh, look, I'm just giving you a personal testimony, you know. I tithe because I, I don't want, you know, that cursed 10% sitting in my treasury. That's why. You know, that's why, you know, like I've said before, I round up. I don't want to miss anything. <laughs> you know? So, look, not doing so is robbing God. And it will be, you, you know, it will become a cursed thing when you rob God. It's very serious. Okay, so that's, you know, kind of what the accursed thing is, why Achan was in so much trouble, why it was, you know, taken so seriously. But there's a lot of lessons here, folks. There's a lot of lessons that we can learn from what Achan did. Here's some additional lessons for you. I'm just going to shotgun about four or five lessons for you this evening from this story. First of all, go back, you know, um, actually turn to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119. And I'm going to read for you Lamentations 340, where the Bible says, Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. People rarely, rarely really self-reflect as much as they should. People should self-reflect more. Look at Psalm 119, verse 59. The Bible says, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. Because here's the thing. In Lamentations 3.40, it says something very similar. It says, let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Self-reflecting is going to cause you to turn again to the Lord. That's what it's going to cause you to do. So instead of just sitting there in your life and saying, you know what? Look, it will alleviate a lot of confusion for you too. Because look, if next time you think, God, why is this happening to me? Why are you doing this to me? Just, why are you allowing this to happen, God? Just check your own house. Self-reflect. Maybe there is a reason for it. Now, I'm saying self-reflect. Don't be Job's friends. We're not to go and, like, see somebody, like a brother who's just going through a really hard time, and be Job's friends and be like, brother, you know, are, are you a, a mess of sin? You know, maybe you're, you must be sinning against the Lord. I mean, don't be Job's friends. This is something we're to do ourselves to self-reflect and then look we, you will you if you'll find stuff is what will happen and then you will take care of those things and you will turn again to the lord that's what the bible's telling us in psalm 119 and lamentations 3 it says self-reflect and you will turn to the lord so i mean when joshua finally figured out god look god gave him the answer here you know, Joshua had the advantage of God just verbally talking to him. We have Psalm 119 and Lamentations 3. Self-reflect, find it, turn to the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay? So look, just consider this a possibility when things are going south in your life. Okay? That's lesson number one. Self-reflect more. Lesson number two is this. Sin, sin, many times, most of the time, I hate to say all the time, but a lot of the time, sin leads to bigger sin. You say, you say, what in the world? You know, th this seems very harsh. This seems very harsh that Achan, he took some silver and he took some gold. And, you know, but look back at verse, um, look, look back at verse number five. It's actually a little bit more serious than you probably realize because he actually murdered 36 people is what Achan did. You know, here he went and he did what he wanted to do just so he could have some stuff and he could steal from the Lord and he got 36 men killed. In verse number 5 it says that 36 men were killed in that first battle where the Lord had left them. Those men didn't know. Those men didn't know they were walking into a battle and the Lord wasn't with them. It was a big secret. So look, sin will always lead to bigger sin. You think, you know what? I'm just going to do this one thing in my life. I'm just going to hang on to this one thing. And I'm just going it, to... It's no big deal. It's not hurting anybody. Look, it's going it's to lead to bigger things. It's going to lead to bigger things. All these people living under bridges, don't tell me they didn't start, you know, drinking and having fun at a party in high school. You know, they're living under a bridge. They're literally digging in trash cans and eating out of garbage. I mean, it started somewhere. You know, it wasn't some teenager that's like, you know what, I want to be a loser, and just started eating out of a trash can. That's not how it happened. It started with something small. Maybe it seemed like something fun. This is sin. It gets its hooks in you, 
And, and some people just can't get, some people will just never get out of it. But sin will always lead to bigger sin. Turn to Luke chapter 8, and verse number 17. What's the next lesson? What's the next lesson? Like I said, sermon series for five weeks we could have here. But what's the next lesson? I'm just going to shotgun a bunch of stuff out at you. Write it down. Write it down if you want to remember it. Look at um, Luke chapter 8 and verse number 17. Here's the next, here's the next lesson from Joshua chapter 7. Look at verse 17. From the words of Jesus. If you have a red letter Bible, these words are read. For nothing is secret that shall be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Here's another thing about sin. Sin in your life, especially saved person, sin in your life will be found out. So when you get into sin, even if it's the smallest thing, just imagine people finding out about it. Because that's what the Bible says is going to happen. It's going to be found out. Sin will not remain secret. That should deter you. Because a lot of people think, you know, no one will ever know about this. But that's not the rules that you're operating under, folks. It will be found out. Big sins, little sins, and, you know, everyone's going to see it. Third lesson. And this is a really big one. This is a really big one. Sin will not just affect you. This is why, this is why, this is why people, they think that they can hang on to something or maybe not separate from something or maybe, look, they know what's right and they know what's wrong. That's the disadvantage that you have coming here is you know what's right and you know what's wrong. And if you just do it anyway, you do it anyway, the price is always going to be higher than what you think you're willing to pay. And please do not miss understand what I'm saying here. You can think and you can think in your head what's the worst thing that could happen. You have no idea. The price will always be higher. First of all, you're going to drag others in. Just as Achan did. And down with you. Look at verse number 5 again. Look at Joshua 7 verse 5. And the men of Ai smote about 30, 30 and 6 men. He drugged these men in and got them killed. Achan and his sin. And look, it, it wasn't just Achan's family that suffered. So, you know, a lot of people think, well, what about Achan's family? You know, you shouldn't be punished for the sins of the father. Well, here's the thing. Either they, the children of Israel went overboard and maybe shouldn't have executed him, or they were in on it. One of those two things. I bet that they were probably all partaking in that sin. They were probably all helping cover up that sin. That's my opinion. The Bible doesn't tell us. But, I mean, he dragged them in too. And he got all of them killed. Look, it was, it was, I mean, 36 families without a father now is, is what Achan sin did. The sad thing about people raising their kids wrong, you think, well, they can just raise their kids wrong and there's no problem. I'll just raise my kids right. But these kids end up ruining other people's lives too. That's the problem. You think of the, you know, I always think of the, the, the school shooter. You know, the, the, the crazy kid that went and shot up a school, whether it be Columbine or whatever, you know, school shooting or, or whatever, you know, these crazy, you know, parents that had no business even having children in the first place that messed up their kids, their kids turned into a bunch of devil worshiping whatever, and they went and murdered other children. Look, their sins affected others. They turn their children, they turn the lives of their family into a train of destruction that drove through other people's lives. That's what Achan did here. It seems with, I mean, you know, Achan, I mean, here they are, they're just having this big successful campaign, and they could have just went along, but look, it just seems like with every group of people, it seems like just in my experience of my short life, it seems like with every group of people, you're always going to have at least one person that just is just going the wrong way. I don't know why that is, but it would be nice in those cases if that person just paid the price, but it never works that way. They drag in others and everyone pays. I mean, I don't know. Aiken, Aiken knew. God laid down these rules just one chapter ago. And he delivered the victory that he said that he would victory. But yet, yet people, people will find out. People know that too. And they do it anyway. They think they can get away with it. Or the price that they have to pay will be worth it, I think is what people think. 
This is why it's so important to separate as we constantly talk about in this church. You know, you talk about, we talk about separating from family that's trying to derail you in your Christian life. We talk about, you know, how about this, old friends. How about old worldly friends? How about this, old ways that you used to do things. I mean, I can tell you, I mean, just God, God told him one chapter ago, I can sit up here and I can tell you again and again and again, but look, if you don't listen, you and those around you will pay. But people still think, I can hang on to this one thing. I'll just tuck this one thing away. I'll just tuck this one thing away, or this person I shouldn't be around, or this lifestyle, or this piece of my culture that I grew up with. I'll just hide it in the earth, and no one will ever know. Look, it doesn't work that way for you. Some of you need to realize that if every single sermon that is preached up here is different than the way that you are used to doing things, maybe you just need to realize that you, everything that you've been brought up to believe is wrong. Maybe you just need to peel that band-aid off. Just throw it all off. It's why, it's why uh, you know, I didn't have this in my notes, but I was talking to Brother Matt, and I'm sorry, I didn't ask him if I could say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is why we're typically, we're typically, churches like this are going to tend to not have like a lot of 70 plus year old people in it. And thank God we do have some of those people. I'm thankful for that. I mean, I love, you know, our older church members here. Don't get me wrong. But typically, a church that just preaches hard against sin is going to be difficult. It's going to be a, typically a younger church. because. And look, I try to soften the blow when it comes to preaching against things that I know people have messed up on in their lives, because that's not really the point. Sins that they've you know, committed in their past, because look, it's all under the blood. It's all under the blood. But I'm not going to soften the message on things, because it's, it's literally not about you looking back. It's about the people, you know, it's about the next generation looking forward. I mean, in just, just in general, if you think, you know, in general, if you, if you come to church and you think, man, every sermon's about me. Look, there's no pastor that is sitting there writing a sermon every single week about you. It, it's, it's not happening. Okay, it's not happening. No pastor does that. First of all, you know, you just... The, you know, that's why we're just going to be younger. Brother Matt said that he went and he visited a church that was more of a, uh, you know, he said like everybody was over 70. And sure enough, it was just this super light message. Just this super, you know, easy to take message. No mention of, of sin or hard preaching from the Bible. Of course. Because you can't get up and preach on fornication and divorce and all these things that people have actually, you know, they've made these mistakes in their lives and they sit there and they're like, oh, every song is about me. <laughs> you know, no. It's about the next gen. Can, hey, can, we, can the next generation do it different, please? Amen. That's what it's about. Look, and, and, or you have a guilty conscience, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing if you hear preaching and you have a guilty conscience. Look, get it right, fix it. That's what the preaching is for. People all the time come up to me, and Pastor used to say this, and I never really understood it, but people all the time come up to me, and they're like, man, I was really convicted from that sermon. And I'm just like, I had no idea you were, that that person was struggling with that. I had no idea. But back to the sermon. Maybe you're just this unique person who can just, who can just listen to preaching about sin that you're in. Maybe you can just listen to preaching about sin that you're in, Sin that you're just going to commit anyway. I mean, that's maddening, first of all. Personally, that's maddening. Yeah. I'm going to sit up here and I preach out of the Bible, and I see you just, like, just, do the, do the, just commit the sin anyway. Just ignore everything. Do it the world way, worldly way. and Just keep coming to church that preaches against this stuff. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. You can do that. If you're, this, if you're this strange person that can sit there and have just take preaching in the face and be like, yeah, yeah, and then just go do it tomorrow, you're still going to pay. You're still going to pay the consequences. That's not me. I'm just trying to help you. 
I'm just trying to look. Achan confessed. Achan's like, I did it. He confessed. He got right. He still paid. And the price will be more than you're willing to pay. It's like going to buy a refrigerator on Craigslist and you, and you see it and it's $200 and you're like, 200 bucks, that's a good deal. And you show up with $200 in your pocket and the guy says, no, it's $5,000 and you have to pay. That's what it is. That's the analogy. And you have to pay it. You can't walk away and say, no, no, no deal. No, you're paying the 5,000. You have to buy it. That, that's what sin's gonna get you into. And you know what? Reputations are they're hard to build and they're easy to destroy. That's another thing. When these things are found out, and then you do the damage to the other people like Aiken did, and, and you're just like, you know, I, I didn't mean for that to happen. Like, I didn't mean for that to happen. I bet Aiken thought that same thing as his whole family was being executed. So look, I mean, it, it, it really takes a humble person. That's why, that's why we're a younger church. We're always going to be a younger church, probably. That's why churches that preach hard on sin tend to be younger churches. Because really, to be somebody who's made a lot of mistakes in your life, to listen to that preaching, and to just be like, you know what? Yeah, I did do that wrong. I did do that wrong, and this is right. These kids need to hear this. And we have some of those people, and thank God for those people. But you know what? That takes a, that takes a tremendous amount of humility to be that type of person. You know, to just be able to just take that preaching and just say, you know what? I've made mistakes, but it's about looking forward now. So look, what did we learn from, from Aiken here? We learned that, look, you can't, you can't hide things, folks. It's not going to work that way for you. Sin is going to come out. He, he, he couldn't hide this. What was he going to do? Just keep sitting on the stuff in his tent and just watch hundreds and hundreds and maybe even thousands of people of, of his nation just get slaughtered because the Lord had left them? So he confessed it. So you can't hide things. We know that it's going to cost you more than you think it's going to cost. You can go ahead and you can rationalize. We're rationalizing creatures. We try to rationalize everything in our lives. Like, oh, I'll just do it this way and this way and this way, and then it'll be okay. And you can even rationalize to the point where it, you think it's not even sin anymore. But you, you know, you're, you have a conscience that's telling you, you know what sin is. Like these people, you know, listening to the preaching of the Bible, Achan knew what sin was. He knew he had done wrong. It's going to cost you more than you want to pay. And, not, and the biggest thing is, you're going to hurt the people around you. You're going to, and that, that's, that's the price that nobody would want to pay, I think. I think when you think of sin, when you think, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to continue to, you know, be in this sin. And I know that it's wrong, and I've heard preaching on it. But when you think about the fact that you could literally be destroying your children, literally be wrecking your children and, and their ability to, you know, maybe even get saved or maybe even raise up and marry and have a good marriage and, and move forward and raise their children. I, I guarantee, this is why I think, by the way, this is why that I think in my life that I look at people that have been divorced maybe 30 years. And I bet you if you would go up and you would ask those people that got divorced, I bet you the vast majority of those people, if you say, you know what, knowing what you know now, knowing what you know now that you went through over the last 30 years, seeing how your kids are now, seeing how your kids are, you know, maybe they're drunks or whatever. I mean, these are all things I've seen. Divorced kids. Look, divorced kids, and I'm not saying that divorced kids can't, you know, turn out and, and, you know, things can't be, with the grace of God, everything's possible. But when they look at, you know, a broken family and the consequences of their sin, and they look back at the price that they actually paid, I bet you, uh, I bet you 99% of them would say, you know what, I should have tried harder to make that work. I should have tried harder because when I got divorced... I was thinking about the consequences I would have to pay. And I know people that have said this. I was thinking, you know what? It's going to cost me some money, but you know what? I'm going to be able to have a nice life. I'm going to be able to, you know, I'll maybe find somebody else to get married, which is against what the Bible says. I'll be able to find somebody else, and maybe I'll have a happy marriage. But they turn out, and they, 30 years later, 
when they look at the train of destruction that has run through their lives, the vast majority of people I know, I guarantee you would say, you know what? We should have worked harder. We should have worked harder. Look, marriage is forever. Amen. God meant marriage to be forever. And when you break that, God hates that. Amen. God hates that. And the consequences are just, I mean, they're unbearable for people. They're unbearable for the children, first of all. You know, the children don't want that. They didn't sign up for that. So what people need to, and the last thing is, people just need to self-reflect more. You need to look at yourself more. Do, you know, men, go through your house. What are you letting into your house? What are, you, what are you letting inside the walls of your house? Because if something is inside, if there's an accursed thing inside the walls of your house, it's your fault. It's not your wife's fault. Because you're in charge. You're the guardian. You're the guard dog of that house. Self-reflect and say, you know what? It, 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 maybe your family's perfect, your marriage is perfect, and your children are, are perfect. But I bet they're not. So just take some time, you know, every week to self-reflect and see what is the state of my home? What is the state of my leadership here? What's the state of this ship that I'm driving? And you know what? Go around and find those accursed things and get them out. Get them out of your house. Go and look, you know, at that computer in your house. Go and look at that cell phone that everybody in your house is walking around with. Make sure that you get these accursed things out of your house. Self-reflect. And then you know what? Maybe some curses of God will be removed. Maybe some curses of God will be removed. We all need to self-reflect more. Look, Achan committed a serious sin here, and his whole family and people in the nation paid for it. I mean, the bottom line is, I said this to the guys earlier, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Let's bow our heads and have a word.